Welcome everybody and thanks a lot for attending to my talk today. It's really wonderful to see so many people. Uh, let me thank uh, Thomas, Marjolaine and Dennis for the invitation. It is an absolute pleasure to be here as part of this uh, uh, PCI webinar uh, series, which is looking extremely exciting. Um, today, my idea is that we would talk a little bit about publication bias in ecology and evolutionary biology. So mostly an introduction to the topic uh, with some snippets here and there. So I will start with a what's up with science, just uh, to get us started. Uh, we will then spend most of today's talk talking about uh, uh, what is publication bias, uh, different types and evidence from here and there, mostly from ecology and evolution examples. And then I'll spend a little bit at the end uh, talking about how we can study uh, publication bias, uh, and if there is actually a way of preventing it. Um, hopefully that kind of opens uh, the space for our question and answer uh, a session, which I hope is really productive. Okay, so what's up with science? This is just to start with an introduction <clears throat> in case you haven't heard. Um, there seems to be uh, some sort of uh, replication crisis uh, going on in science. Uh, uh, this is nothing new, but uh, it was really uh, showcased with the reproducibility project in psychology, which was published a, a few years back now, so six or seven, led by Brian Nosek with uh, a huge amount co of collaborators. Uh, the idea of this project was basically to try and, and replicate a uh, hundred uh, uh, findings that were considered important in psychology. And the idea was to do it by having multiple replications across different places in the world and to use uh, a large uh, statistical power to do so. And overall, the findings were a bit shocking for many people. So the overall effect size seemed to be about half of uh, that of the original studies. And although replication or replicability is a kind of, a kind of difficult thing to, to estimate, they estimated it at around 50% with a lot of studies, uh, not, or a lot of the evidence not being statistically significant uh, compared to how the original evidence was. So that kind of started what uh, I like to call rather than the replication crisis, the credibility revolution, which is a term that uh, I believe was uh, used first by Semin. Um, and that also got us started into perhaps or more interested in the open science movement. So societies such as uh, Sortie uh, 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 appeared only three years ago per print servers such as Ecoevo Archive uh, did too. Uh, and a lot of journal policies and funding policies are being implemented these days. Here, I just wanted to perhaps say that thanks to the PCI for supporting Sorti. Uh, so just a snippet there. Uh, so what do we know about replication in ecology and evolution? Uh, in ecology and evolution, it, it is only now that certain multi-lab uh, projects uh, seem to be uh, starting, but as far as I'm aware, nothing as big as any of the reproducibility projects in, in psychology or cancer biology. What we know about replication in ecology and evolution is that we considered it to be important, it seems. So this is uh, these are the results from a survey of more than 400 ecologists, uh, where uh, most of them, 97% said that uh, it is very important or somewhat important. Um, however, we don't do it very often. I mean, we do, but mostly on the type of quasi-replication, which here we can define as testing uh, a hypothesis, but doing so in a different species. And we seem to be pretty good at that in ecology and, and evolution. So this is actually data from uh, three um, uh, um, journals in animal behavior. And you can see that it's around 70% of the studies that could be considered quasi-replications, which is pretty high. Uh, but exact replication, or what some people could call true replication, is almost zero, if not zero. At least we do a decent amount of partial and conceptual replication, around maybe 30%. 
Uh, partial and conceptual replication here is defined as uh, studies that test the same or similar hypothesis, but they use different methods. And this is precisely what allows us to do meta-analysis in this field. What we also know about replication in ecology and evolution is that we do not seem to like using the word replication to name our studies. So th this is a text mining approach, uh, searching for the word replication uh, in or different varieties of the word replication in almost 40,000 studies published in the field, showing that only 0.023% of the studies says define themselves as replications. This could be related to the fact that we normally have to try and sell novelty. And this is not too far off from other fields uh, where replication rates seems to be rather low, but still a bit lower, I would say, than in most fields. It is perhaps not surprising then that uh, suggestions such as this one are considered almost uh, revolutionary. So this is just an example that I read recently uh, where uh, the suggestion was that funding agencies such as the NSF uh, should be uh, spend 0.1% of their funding each year on replication studies. And I was kind of shocked to, to see that this is kind of the expectation we have to make a change, but maybe it's only the, the start. Maybe it's actually what we need, that these funding agencies commit at least such a small amount of their percentage uh, of their funding uh, on, on replications to get us started. Just quick stop here to make sure we are using, or we are, yeah, we are defining replication uh, similarly uh, in this talk. So when I say replication, I mean using the same methods or the same analysis or more or less the same on different data to test the hypothesis with a different data. Whereas if we are talking about reproducibility, what I mean is that using the same data and using the same analysis or methodology. And why I'm saying this is because we can also look at reproducibility. And this has been done in, in ecology and evolution. So we, did, uh, we looked at reproducibility potential a couple of years now by uh, focusing on journals that had some uh, code sharing policies. And here we define reproducibility potential as both providing the code, the analytical code used for the analysis, uh, the statistical analysis in the study and the data used. And we estimate it to be smaller than 20% really, if we account for other sources of, uh, um, yeah, that would limit reproducibility. Um, I mean, having the code might not be necessary to reproduce a study, uh, perhaps in some cases, but in ecology with the type of complex analysis that we do sometimes and the limited space we have to the, the give details about our methodology, I would say that is heavily needed, uh, the code, I mean. We are doing currently a, a follow-up project uh, focusing on journals with our code sharing policies, only to find that those numbers are actually really, really low when the journals do not have any sort of code sharing policy or encouragement. So you can also study computational reproducibility. We are doing so and people have done so. And the first uh, step that you have to do to estimate computational reproducibility is to, to see how many of the studies you can test. And normally this is associated to, to whether data is available either online or because the authors want or not or don't want to share it. And the truth is that most of the studies are not testable for computational reproducibility. And when we can test it, it seems that reproducibility is not as close to 100% as we would expect or like it to be. So most of what we know about replication in ecology and evolution comes from indirect sources, such as the study of publication bias. And what is publication bias? Well, surprise, not all studies are published. Uh, so some studies are published uh, are not published because uh, there are no resources. So at some point along the process of uh, conducting a study, resources might go away. For example, by resources, we could mean 
uh, the actual researches, searching, uh, changing positions, or even leaving academia, or because the authors have lost interest in the study. A study that they originally thought was interesting is no longer interesting because of perhaps the results, but they were not exciting. Uh, maybe they found some methodological flaws, um, either them or the reviewers in the first time they submitted it, or because the topic might not be so hot anymore and maybe they just decide to move on if they have more studies to sample. Normally, we associate publication bias uh, with uh, uh, the results. So I think most people would think about or think of publication bias as the file drawer problem where and statistically non-significant results seems to be less available in the literature than statistically significant ones. But it's not only that, because it's, it can also be dissemination biases. So some studies uh, might be, or some results might be disseminated more than others, creating some bias in, in how uh, the truth is represented or perceived by the readers. Some studies might be published before and some might be published later for multiple reasons that we can talk about later. And some studies or some results might be more or less or even non-accessible. So certain type of results could be uh, less well reported um, in, a, in a study and therefore less accessible for synthesis than other studies. In all, I think we could consider publication bias uh, as whenever we see that the effect size is included, in this case, in a meta-analysis, generate a different conclusion from what a meta-analysis or the overall effect size of a meta-analysis that would include all uh, existing uh, effect sizes would, would lead to. And the problem with this is that normally it will lead to some distortion for whatever hypothesis we are interested in, in understanding. Today, I'm going to just talk about three, or I'm going to categorize publication biases in three. There are more, uh, but I think this would be the ones that I would like to highlight uh, today and because of uh, the different studies that are available at, uh, out there. Uh, I want to talk about citation biases to start with, uh, then small study effects, and then decline effects. Citation biases, uh, I want to highlight two examples. Uh, uh, one is confirmation bias and another would be a prestige bias. So confirmation bias, uh, uh, I think it's well showcased in this study that is now more than 10 years old, but I think it's actually a very good uh, study, a secondary meta-analysis, uh, including or analyzing uh, 52 meta-analysis, uh, in, including overall almost 4,000 studies in ecology. And what they found, among many other things, is that there seem to be uh, uh, ecologists seem to be uh, citing uh, to confirm their preconceived ideas. And the evidence they found for this is that stronger effects were cited more often, regardless of whether uh, these effects were uh, negative effects. So if the hypothesis uh, uh, relied on a, on a negative uh, uh, effect, uh, the stronger, the most negative effects would be cited more than the less uh, negative effects and vice versa. And they call this as theory tenacity, which is basically as described uh, where there, are, there is like a persistent belief in a theory despite contradictory evidence. Regarding citation biases, I think this is a very interesting study where uh, the authors, it's not in ecology, it's across fields, where the authors uh, uh, tried to track 250 citations uh, in five of the fanciest uh, journals uh, and realized that 25% of all the citations they looked at lacked substantiation, meaning that um, it wasn't clear why they were there or they were just uh, wrongly cited. And this, together with certain biases uh, uh, that we know of, such as citing uh, preferentially uh, uh, journals uh, with a high impact factor or citing preferentially stronger effects, could lead to a, a, a good amount of citation bias. And at the end, a good amount of dissemination bias, depending on the results, perhaps, of the study. And this example, I always like to highlight it uh, because it's kind of funny that there seems to be 
and a paper indexed by Google Scholar that does not exist. It's actually not a paper, but it has been cited more than a thousand times. Last time I checked, it was on 1,347, but I was positively surprised yesterday to see that I could not find it anymore. So maybe Google is no longer indexing this study. Whether it will still be continuously cited, that's another question. And regarding prestige bias, I mean, we touched on some already, and the authors of this study also provided some evidence that the uh, results from different journals, so basically that results uh, uh, published in, in high-impact factor journals seem to be cited more. Uh, that's a type of prestige bias. But the one that I wanted to highlight here is an experiment that I think it would be interesting to follow up and perhaps do in ecology where uh, they selected 112 studies. They randomly allocated them into two groups. Uh, half of them will be cited by uh, 11 delegates, they call them, with a, a strong followership in, in Twitter, so more than 50,000 followers. And the other half would not be treated by those, uh, by those uh, 11 delegates. And they found that after one year, uh, there seemed to be uh, an effect, an increase in the number of citations of those papers that were cited, uh, sorry, tweeted, uh, and then therefore exposed potentially to more people. Whether that effect uh, remains in the long term is to be seen. Uh, I would not be surprised if it does, because having a head start might help. But it's certainly uh, something to consider when we, yeah when we uh, decide how to uh, showcase our studies and the effect that it can have. Okay, so that was about citation biases. Uh, I would like to talk now about small, uh, small study effects, which I think it would be what most people have in mind when they think about publication bias. So the classic uh, file drawer problem. So a way of representing small study effects would be by using a funnel plot here. Uh, this is just simulated data. Uh, I'm representing uh, correlation coefficients on the y-axis. Uh, uh, and in the x-axis, I'm using a measure of precision of the effect size, in this case, sample size, but you could be use, uh, using precision or the inverse of the standard error. Uh, what you can see is that uh, the overall true effect of this simulated data, data set is around 0.2, a correlation coefficient of 0.2. And what you can clearly observe is that there is a funnel shape. That's why we call it funnel plot, where variance around the true effect, if that would ever exist, uh, reduces uh, as long as you increase sample size or, or precision. So these data points are correlation coefficients. Let's think of it, for example, as the correlation between the size of this uh, black patch in male house sparrows and the dominance status of the individuals. Uh, which can be determined by looking at interactions over food. And small study effects, we normally observe them when there is asymmetry in this funnel plot. So what we mean is that there are some studies that are missing, normally small studies, so small sample sizes, and generally studies that are statistically non-significant, or even studies that could go just against the general belief. So the way that we can then study or try to find some evidence for, for small study effects is by looking at uh, the asymmetry in this funnel plot, by looking at whether effects become smaller as sample size or precision increases. That's a way of trying to estimate uh, small study effects, even though really understanding publication bias is really, really hard. So in ecology, there are multiple examples. Uh, I think uh, it is a popular thing to test in meta-analysis in ecology and evolution. Not all meta-analysis do it, and they probably should, but many do. And there is quite a bit of evidence uh, of small study effects in, most, in many meta-analysis in ecology and evolution. So here I'm just show, showcasing an example that I like it because of how comprehensive it is. Um, this is a... a well, a set of meta-analyses trying to understand the function of the plumage coloration of a small Eurasian bird, the blue tit. Uh, it included almost 50 studies on the topic, almost 600 effect sizes, and it found evidence of small study effects and other publication biases uh, pretty much in all the 
hypothesis that were tested. To the point that the main conclusion that the author of study uh, threw out there was that, I'm gonna read, the only high, highly robust conclusion supported by this meta-analysis is that male blue tits have plumage that reflects more light than that of females, which is something that to be fair, you almost do not need a meta-analysis to do it. As you can almost see it uh, visually, although it's better using a spectrophotometer. There are other examples in ecology and evolution, and here I wanted to highlight one uh, that came out of the master thesis of uh, Bora Kim, where we tried to understand uh, what is the, uh, well, we'll try to understand if male size in this group of fish, the Gambusia uh, genus, and this is the male. So we wanted to know if male size is uh, is a predictor of fitness in in this piece, well, in this group of species. The idea was that based on our reading of the literature, that it would be small males that have an advantage. And that has some evolutionary uh, consequences that I'm not getting to it, but it was an interesting question. That's why, why we tried to, to answer it. We actually found the opposite. So there seemed to be evidence overall for the effect to be positive, meaning that the bigger you are, if you are a Gambusia male, uh, the more fitness you, you will have. Although there is a lot of heterogeneity across studies, which is very well represented by the prediction intervals and by the spread of the data. But what I wanted to get into here is that if we would have focused our meta-analysis only on the results that we obtained from the published literature, what we would have found is that there was a strong evidence for asymmetry in this funnel plot or strong evidence for small study effects. So this is what you can see in this plot where there is a, a strong negative correlation or uh, yeah, correlation, let's say, uh, with of uh, between the effect size and the study sample size, meaning that the effect size or the evidence for this hypothesis is declining as long as you increase sample size, which is not good news in principle. The good thing of this meta-analysis, if I can say, is that because we did the effort of trying to dig in extra data by looking at open data sets and reanalyzing them ourselves, we could at least mitigate this potential effect of small study effects on our general conclusion. There were still some evidence, not statistically significant, but a tendency, but we could mitigate it quite well. So we could say that we found potentially that our results are seemingly robust, even though we still don't know what would happen if we would really have access to all the data, assuming that this analysis really is telling us that there is still missing data despite our efforts. Okay, so that was about small study effects, a couple of examples. The last one I wanted to touch on is the Klein effects, which is basically um, the phenomenon that we observe sometimes in some meta-analysis where effect sizes are becoming smaller over time, meaning that the evidence for a certain hypothesis might be higher in the past than it is in the present. And in some extreme cases, the evidence just simply disappeared in recent, in recent uh, studies or in the most uh, updated studies, let's sort of say. Uh, this could be because of true changes, true biological changes, uh, such as if we are thinking of uh, the fish efficacy of antibiotics, uh, and we are studying that. Uh, perhaps if we observe that the efficacy is uh, uh, going down, it could be because of resistance uh, to antibiotics. So a true biological effect that is actually very interesting in itself. It could also be because there are changes in, in the methods or the study organisms. Uh, here is an example where uh, two meta-analyses uh, got opposite conclusions. So one meta-analysis was conducted or published in 1997 and the other one in 2010, and they seem to lead to the opposite conclusions. Uh, these two meta-analyses were testing on whether the uh, removal of predators would have a, an influence on population size of other species. And the reason for these opposite conclusions was seemingly because, as detailed by Smith et al., what they observed is that more island studies were conducted over time. And when they explored this, they found that it seems that 
on island populations, the effect of removing predators is very close to zero. So there's, there doesn't seem to be much evidence of that. So basically just by changing what was being studied, the conclusions were changing. Now, what we should do is to combine all of it to see if there is evidence across. And if it is really true that in island populations, uh, uh, this hypothesis then doesn't apply, then the best perhaps is to then present the results separated by type of uh, population. This is just a reminder to update meta-analysis, something that sometimes is not very um, accepted by journals or the community, but I, I really like to do it and I recommend doing it. So I think every meta-analysis should be accept, uh, should be uh, updated after certain years because there are a lot of things to find after, after doing that. Most of the time though, decline effects are associated or thought to be because of systematic biases, such as uh, which, uh, results are uh, reported and when, uh, whether journals accept them more or less quickly or reject them entirely, and whether also authors decide to push uh, for certain results to be in out sooner or later. Uh, perhaps the first example in ecology and evolution would be this study uh, published in 2000, where uh, by looking at uh, uh, studies conducted uh, on the field of whether parasites uh, manipulate the, the behavior of their host, uh, the author found that there seemed to be a negative association or correlation in this case between um, the effect size and the year of publication, meaning that uh, recent uh, uh, studies on this topic seem to uh, uh, provide less evidence for the hypothesis that parasites host their behavior. But this is not something only exclusive from the past, from the 70s to the 2000s, but it's something that we found recently also on topics such as the status signaling hypothesis in birds. In this uh, meta-analysis, uh, basically we wanted to test uh, whether we still have, we basically updated a, a meta-analysis that was more than 10 years old to see if there is still evidence that the black patch that male house parrots show is potentially a proxy for dominant status. And what we found is that the evidence for this seem to have decreased over time to the point that recent studies do not seem to show much evidence for, for this hypothesis. And there are more examples. Another one that I think I would like to uh, uh, highlight here because it, it is really a very strong uh, case is whether ocean acidification affects uh, fish behavior. Uh, this has been a popular study over the last few years uh, with a lot of research done. Uh, you can see that this meta-analysis included uh, 91 studies overall, and they found rather strong uh, evidence for, for the evidence uh, yeah, going down over time. This is actually a special case that I wanted to highlight because uh, I would recommend reading the commentary, uh, the reply to the commentary, for this paper and also to dig into a little bit of the fraud allegations and um, yeah it is a good interesting uh, read to to understand a little bit how things can go wrong rather quickly so how can we study and prevent publication bias this will be section three and and last hopefully i'm not doing too bad on time so the first thing is how we already showed. Uh, so we could do uh, we could test for evidence of small study effects or or decline effects in first order meta analysis, as we as most of the examples before showed. But we can also use second order. Uh, well, and I would recommend using uh, the method that we suggested recently. Um, so it's a multi level meta regression, which allows you to account for uh, heterogeneity explained by other moderators, and we think it's a strong way of uh, testing um, for publication bias, particularly in ecology and evolution where heterogeneity is extremely high. Another way is to do secondary uh, or second order meta-analysis. Uh, that was, we already showed an example with the uh, citation biases. And here is another one that we did recently across ecology and evolution. The, one of the good things of a, a secondary meta-analysis is that it allows you to provide a field-wide uh, uh, answer 
uh, to the question by combining, well, in this case, you can see it's almost, yeah, more than 17,000 effect sizes across meta-analysis and primary studies. Um, and in our case, our results seem to confirm that there is still, there is, there is evidence for small study effects across studies when you combine them all. Um, and the same for the Klein effects. The Klein effects, uh, there are a couple of recent papers that are very interesting in ecology and evolution and that I could not present today, but I, I would recommend reading. Uh, they do not seem to be as common as, uh, as uh, small study effects, um, but we still find evidence across if we think of the field as an entire field. So it, yeah, it is an interesting topic to, to dig into. Perhaps we are doing better at avoiding the Klein effects uh, over time. Something to really explore and hopefully uh, new meta research studies. In this study, what we also found is that, uh, of course, when you account for these potential biases, uh, which already makes some assumptions because, well, quite a few assumptions, because as I said before, studying publication bias is really a guesswork, it's a pure estimation. And what we could see is that, um, of course, the, the overall effects, once you adjust for these publication biases, uh, uh, go down. So there's less evidence for the hypothesis being tested overall across the fields. And also we found that many of the originally statistically significant uh, meta-analytic means uh, turn out to be statistically non-significant once you account for this uh, publication bias. If we assume that this uh, adjust, I mean, it's probably the best we can do, but it doesn't mean it's, the, it's still the 100% correct way. Uh, you can also do some extra tests to study publication bias. So for example, you could uh, compare published versus unpublished uh, uh, data. Um, this can be done if you have access to unpublished data because of open data sets or because you contact authors. You can also test whether blinding uh, data collection affects the results or whether uh, re uh, studies that report results uh, selectively or incompletely tend to provide stronger effects. So these are many type of tests that you can do to, to see if there's any evidence for publication biases, assuming uh, publication biases, a bunch of potential biases. But you can also use prior registration, which in this case, it can be, it can help you to prevent publication bias potentially, and it can help you to study it. And so a pre-registration for those that haven't heard of, uh, of it uh, is a timestamp record of the decision around the study design methods and analysis. The idea is that you do that before you've seen any results so that you cannot be biased later on and consciously biased later on in what you report or decide to potentially publish. Well, that's the idea at least. It is a way of trying to separate the two extremes with a big gray area in the middle of what we could consider at the one extreme exploratory research from a confirmatory research. There is some evidence that it leads to effect size being smaller, at least some early evidence. But I think uh, the use of pre-registration, I mean, we can use pre-registration to understand publication bias in a, in a good way. Uh, so this is a study. Um, we're using data from the Food and Drug Administration database. Uh, so these drug tests are normally, you have, it's mandatory that you pre-register them. And these authors follow the fate of 100 of those registrations. And what you can see in this plot is how, um, if, uh, yeah, how uh, half of the studies uh, did not find support for the original hypothesis, and about half of those were not published, at least in the time frame that they, they studied. Uh, then there was some outcome reporting bias, meaning that some of the studies that did not find uh, uh, evidence for the original hypothesis, they kind of wrote their studies using some of the other results that they found and were considered to be more interesting so that they would look like as if they found evidence for the original hypothesis. And this is all the uh, red dots that become green. Then there was some spin bias which basically was researchers phrasing their results so that it would sound like still as if they would have found uh, some evidence for their original hypothesis. And at the end, they could also follow 
the citation bias and show that it seems that those results that said to have found evidence for the original hypothesis were cited more often than those that did not. So I think this is a very good use of pre-registration. So this is what they call also inception cohort studies. I learned from the study of Ensig and, and Daniel Lackens. Um, with these studies, uh, you can estimate, or you can get an estimate of how many studies remain unpublished. Um, the latest estimate is precisely from this uh, study from Ensig and Lackens, where they found that uh, around 39% of the registrations uh, remained unpublished after four years, uh, with a prediction of that affecting 32% of all uh, registrations at the Open Science Framework. What I found very interesting about this study too is that they follow up on the authors that did not publish their, their studies and they had 55 respondents. And it was very interesting to see that most of the reasons that the author said, uh, or the main reason for why the author said that they did not publish their study was because of logistical issues. So things such as funding, resources going away. So uh, research is going away, changing um, careers or changing position and never being able to finish the, the project. And only 25% uh, mentioned that it was because of the results, which I, I found very interesting and certainly something to perhaps follow up in the future and really see if maybe we've been misunderstanding uh, publication bias. Maybe a lot of it comes from people actually not having resources. And maybe that's something we can change more easily by providing more resources. I mean, it's of course not easy, but. All right, and last but not least, I would like to talk about what I think it really would help and should help preventing publication bias. And these are registered reports. Um, registered reports are a type of journal article, uh, article where basically you submit, let's say you submit your pre-registration to a journal, the editor reads it, decides to send it to reviewers or not, and the reviewers reads it, decide that it's good enough, uh, um, well enough to be accepted. And if that's the case, if your study, your pre-registration is accepted at the stage one, uh, the journal then commits to publish it, no matter what results you find. So this, of course, makes the publication of a study independent of the results. And if that's really the case, then we would really, really be uh, fighting uh, publication bias actively. So registered reports are offered by many journals these days, uh, more than 300. I think it's far beyond that by now. In ecology and evolution, there is a good list and it's increasing. So the recent uh, um, journals that uh, are offering registered reports are like Nature, Ecology and Evolution, PCI, not that recently, but still recently. And actually, I would really like you to look into the PCI registered reports because they're fantastic. And they also have a system that is much more author friendly, I would say, given the, the times that we normally work with. The early evidence for registered reports uh, um, helping us fight in publication bias comes from psychology. Um, there are a couple of studies. Uh, this is my favorite, uh, showing that uh, when you look at standard reports or standard studies that were not uh, registered reports, uh, most of the tests, or most of the evidence, oh, yeah, most of the statistical tests show statistical significant support for the original uh, uh, hypothesis to the point that, I mean, we are talking of 96% or so, which, I mean, it's already a little bit suspicious. And when you do the same with the comparable register reports, that rate is much lower, meaning that actually is less than 50%. And I think this is very, very good news because it just shows that, yeah, I mean, it shows evidence that we there is clearly an effect on whether you decide or you can uh, publish a study based on the results. And if we will, if we if all the studies will be registered reports, perhaps we could actually have a non-distorted view or a less distorted view of uh, of the science about. In ecology and evolution, we are waiting for you because I mean there are still not enough registered reports for us to kind of 
do this type of meta research studies but i think it's about time and in a few years we will be able to do it so i really would like to encourage you to to get into it maybe a crazy idea that i also learned from this uh, study by and uh, by the lackens um that i think maybe it could be something that pci could implement uh, as a journal or a pci type would be a, a place where authors could disclose their file drawer and provide a list of the studies that they've conducted and never published and provide the summary statistics so that they can use a meta-analysis it doesn't need to be i mean the good thing of this is that it, it would not take a lot of effort to just provide the basics of the study uh, so that they are usable for future evidence synthesis in sum it would be a pity if what if a lot of what we do in across fields and in ecology and evolution uh, a lot of the studies we do or a lot of the science we do uh, could potentially be wasted at the end uh, this is definitely a i mean a big concern um and with that loomy message i would just like to kind of motivate for those ecologists and evolutionary biologists and other fields that would like to support uh, open, reliable, and transparent science uh, to join SORT. Um, hopefully I was not too long, but I think I was. Uh, thanks a lot for attending to, to this talk. And really, I'm looking forward to your questions and try to have a nice chat and try to figure out what we can do to solve these issues. Thanks a lot.